Welcome to a new episode of Delphine Circle, where we uncover the mind, body, and spirit of success. Subscribe now for free to receive updates on the latest interviews. Then sit back, relax, and tune in. Hi, Christian, and welcome to The Circle. Thank you much. So happy to have you here. Uh, as part of this Mind, Body, Spirit series, I've been super excited about bringing in some different modalities, and I've been wanting to do one on breathwork for a long time because breathwork is something that I've become passionate about lately. Mm. But it's been hard to find somebody that is as articulate about breathwork as you are. So mm. when we met recently through um, our good friend Tanya, she uh, hosted a breathwork session here with, at her beautiful home um, with you, and I was just blown away by it. So I'm so happy to have you. Well, I'm very excited to be here. Yay! For our audience, let me formally introduce you as our Christian Menson, international speaker, best-selling contributing author, trainer, coach, and founder of Breathflow Wellness uh, International, mm -hmm. a renowned holistic health and wellness platform. Christian, um, I had a breathwork experience with you, and, and I had done breathwork, you know, quite a few times before, but I wasn't in love with it. Um, but when I did the breathwork session with you the other night, it literally blew my mind. I like, I, you know, I, was like, <laughs> I saw God, like this was incredible. Um, so for people who may not be that familiar with breathwork, let's just start by diving right in and what is breath work? So that is a very big term. Breath work yeah. can encompass a whole lot of things. So to narrow it down into the type of breath work that I specialize in, I would call this an integrative breath work, which mm -hmm. is a process of consciously becoming aware of your breath, harnessing it to certain patterns and allowing those patterns then to help activate and release energy from your system and create deeper connection to your intuitive awareness. Why is that important? Why is it important? Well, it is, our breath is at the foundation of our health, physical health, emotional health, and ultimately even the spiritual health. And so to understand and to become conscious that, I like to say every breath we take is either subtly reinforcing habits of physical, emotional, and spiritual health that are positive or subtly reinforcing habits of physical, emotional, and spiritual health that are negative. Mm -hmm. uh, just like putting money in the bank, you put a penny in every day, it doesn't really look like much in a week, a month, maybe even a year, but 10 years down the road, you start to have you know, a, a substantial sum. The same way with every breath we take, one breath, months worth of breathing, a year's worth of breathing isn't really going to affect our lives that much. But over time, you compound that breath, which we're taking 17,000 times a day over five or 10 years. All of a sudden, the, the way we breathe is creating either health ailments or supporting uh, a healthy and strong physical, emotional, and spiritual environment for us. Yeah. And also just in actually having some pretty powerful therapy to help release things that you might be holding on to, right? Because that's what I think I've really seen such a huge breakthrough in, in terms of my breathwork practice. Exactly. As we, uh, as we start working with the breath, I think most people come to me because they find that there is a, an emotional component that really helps to cathartically release old stored emotional energy, often traumas, repressions, suppressions, energy that we didn't want to experience at some time in our life or didn't have the capacity to handle. And so we held on to that energy. But as I like to quote the psychotherapist Sigmund Freud as saying, unexpressed emotions never die. They just reemerge in darker and uglier ways. And so to, to really understand that this energy that we're holding on to isn't gone because we're not conscious of it, it actually continues to agitate our system and leak out in these darker and uglier ways, which I would say really shows up in the way that people relate in society today. Absolutely. Well, I read one time that said, if you want to know how important your breath is, try to go more than five minutes without it. <laughs> right? That's a great, a great quote. You know, yeah. we can go what 40 days without food, um, about five days without water. 
but only about five minutes or so without breath unless you're trained to free dive or something like that. So give us a little example, because I think when people are hearing about breath work, they're like, what does that mean? I breathe all day long. I, I'm doing breath work. So can you give us a, an example of what it looks like to do breath work? Sure. When, when I, and again, when we're talking about breath work it, it, in this context, I'm talking about the breath flow integrated breathing process. And this is what I call a full free flowing breath, full breath. So we want to take a breath starting in our belly, going all the way up to our chest, a free breath, meaning nice and relaxed, easeful, graceful breath, not, not forcing it out or not controlling it out. And then a flowing breath, a connected movement where we're not pausing between the inhales or exhales or find ourselves holding our breath unconsciously for long periods of time. So, the process itself, we breathe through the mouth and we breathe at a faster pace, starting with the belly. You blow up the belly like a big balloon. I usually like to do the belly first and then move into the chest, but for the sake of this, we're gonna just go right into the chest mm -hmm. and then exhale. You know, when you were directing us to do that in that session, I was thinking how interesting it is because I was trying to focus on the idea of breathing into my stomach and how <clears throat> awkward that felt. And it made me realize how shallow we, we really <clears throat> do breathe, right? The idea of actually completely filling ourselves with air was not, didn't feel common, felt awkward. Well, and especially I'd say the education women get, uh, and men too, for that matter, we got to, especially here in Southern California, you know, go to the beach. My uncle used to say, any women on the beach? No, oh, good. Yeah, you know, just let that let that belly out. But we're we're taught we have to hold that belly in. You know, there's a certain standard of beauty that's a very svelte waistline and all that. But in doing so, we're actually constricting the diaphragmatic action, which is happening, which naturally pushes out the contents of the belly. So if you imagine you're trying to push out on something that is rigid and hard, it's not moving very much. And so our breath tends to then be very shallow, which, you know, keeps that, that uh, svelte belly, but we actually start to, again, this is one of those habits that compounded over time is going to lead to greater anxiety, greater stress, greater brain fog, just listlessness and, and lack of energy, potentially um, more uh, capacity to welcome in disease or dysfunction into our, our physical health. So. It is very important to get that belly breath going because this is really showing a healthy movement of the diaphragm, which is our breathing muscle. And, and that, you know, that's the foundation of breathing. Breathing is the foundation of our health. So we really want to make sure that that belly is going. I love that. I, the first time I ever did breath work, I was actually at a retreat and um, the guide was walking us through it. And I got to tell you, it was really challenging for me. I, I was having a hard time with it. And I, I literally came out of that breathwork session going, okay, this isn't for me. This is not for me. I, my body did not like that. <laughs> but it was a three day retreat. So we had to do it again the next day. And then the next day I did kind of get into it a little bit better. And I was thinking, okay, this is not as bad as, uh, the first day. And by the third day, I was like, okay, I think I can do this. I really, I, I started understanding that what my body was doing was, was kind of tensing up when I first started doing it and was maybe not feeling comfortable with it. Why is it, I mean, we breathe every day. Why is it that when we start this process, it can kind of be challenging? Right. A uh, very good question. And you know, we breathe every day, but I would pose the question, how many days of our lives have we actually been taught how to breathe, right? Uh, we usually come out of the womb, doctor smacks us on the butt, we start crying, they say, okay, the breathing is happening, good to go. And that's about the last we ever uh, experience anything about the breath, unless you maybe take a yoga class and they do some alternate nostril breathing or something like that. So. Breathing is a habit that we can do poorly or we can do uh, in, a, in a better way. Just like walking, people walk, you know, they, they either walk on the outside of their foot, they walk on the inside of their foot or kind of walk in the middle of their, their foot. Any of those patterns taken to the extreme starts to create problems in the knees, problems in the, the hips, the back. 
And so there is a proper way to walk, right? There, there's a way to walk that, that can hurt our health and there's a way to walk that can help. So in the same way with breathing, there's a, a proper way to breathe. Most of us have learned to breathe just, as I said, nobody's taught us, so we've, we've learned just randomly. And what happens is when we're, we're hit with traumas, uh, uh, things in life that are difficult, that actually modifies the way we breathe. And if, if it's strong enough, we can start to develop a habit that is dysfunctional. So when then somebody's teaching you a more functional way to breathe, a healthier way to breathe, we have to go against our bad habit and try to override that. And so if you've ever tried to release a bad habit and create a new one, which I'm sure you've had and, and many of the listeners oh, have. <laughs> no bad. Well, the, maybe you're the exception here. But the, uh, you know, it's difficult. You have to unlearn what you've learned and then you've got to learn something new. And it, at first it's not that easy. To your credit, you know, after three days, it started to become much easier, and that that I shows a, a sort of a resilience, right, an, an ability to adapt, ability to let go of what you thought you knew and try something new. Mm-hmm. And I know, and I, you know, in preparing for this interview, I started reading about the health benefits, and there's just numerous health benefits that comes along with it. So, talk to us a little bit about what people experience once they've gotten into more of a habitual routine. Once you get into a routine. So, you know, again, physical, emotional, and spiritual levels, our breath is the confluence of all these dimensions of our being. So physically, we're learning to breathe in more oxygen. And the bottom line is all of our cells work better with oxygen. The oxygen is the number one energy source that, that runs our cells, runs the cellular metabolism. So when cells are fed oxygen, they're like, they perk up, you know, they're, they're ready to go. And so muscle cells are gonna be stronger, more resilient. Our organs are gonna function better. Our senses come online um, in a heightened way. Uh, we tend to sleep better, we detox better. So just physically, we are operating at more optimal levels. I think, once again, the emotional dimension, the benefits are really an emotional catharsis, releasing all this old energy we were talking about, bringing our emotions into more stable balance, and ultimately, over the course of time, really developing a healthy relationship with all of our emotional states, which is one of the things I really stress, uh, not being afraid to face sadness or anger or fears and you know, only hoarding our happiness and our, our our, our peace and joy, but to welcome these other emotions in, recognizing ultimately that all of our emotional states have some message to bring us. And as we listen to them, uh, we, we find that they're informing our lives for our benefit, to help steer us in a direction that's going to uh, create more health and balance. And then of course, the spiritual dimension is, is my favorite dimension. And as we work with the breath, we're not only working with oxygen, but prana or the life force energy that's imbued in the oxygen and this life force energy is the highest frequency of life so if we imagine we're vibrating at a certain frequency and if we're kind of lost in our stuff it can be a very low frequency this high frequency is vibrating as we bring more of it in we're creating this resonance in our bodily field which entrains or raises our frequency to that When that happens, a a number of things can happen. We can connect with our intuitive insight. So we just know things, answers to problems, solutions to to challenges. Uh, We, our creativity tends to fire on all cylinders. This is the energy of creation itself. So it is stimulating our own individual creativity. And I think the, the most powerful benefits is a certain sense of connection we start to feel, connecting to ourselves, we start to connect to others that, that are in the room with nature. us, nature, and ultimately to the source of this energy, whether we call that God or the universe or the I am presence or however you relate to that. I love it. I love it. Yay! Mm-hmm. You know, I think also about, um, we hear so much about how this generation, this young generation that's coming up and, you know, the effects of the pandemic and people are stressed out people are so anxious and 
it's so wonderful to have natural remedies and things that people can do on their own that is not requiring a prescription. It's not requiring something you have to pay for or, you know, it's something that we have within ourselves. Like we've all been raised with, you know, oh, the answers are within yourself. And you're like, well, where are they? Well, this is a big one, right? Right. Our yes. Breath. The answer is right underneath your nose, basically, in your breath. And yeah, and you mentioned stress and anxiety, and this is one of, one of the things that breathwork is supreme at helping to alleviate. And here's where I was mentioning earlier, our habits of breathing can either create positive or negative uh, experiences of emotional health in this case. The, the pattern of breathing shallow is actually a pattern that is induced when we're feeling anxious or stress. They kind of, it's a package. The, the emotions we feel come with corresponding breathing patterns. And so stress and anxiety tend to come with a shallower, more rapid breath pattern, or sometimes a held breath pattern where we, we're, we're unconsciously holding our breath. So just as the emotion induces that pattern, the reverse can be true. The pattern can induce the emotion. So if you're feeling chronically stressed, chronically anxious and such, <clears throat> excuse me, look at if you habituated yourself to a shallow breathing pattern, which I would say is kind of an epidemic in probably not only our country, but the world as I've traveled all over and seen how people breathe. This, by breathing shallow, we're constantly sending signals to our brain to be on high alert, to be stressed, to be anxious. Mm -hmm. And there might not be anything in our environment that's necessarily inducing that. We have now created a habit that keeps us on this low or high grade anxiety or stress vibe and this over time can you know can lead to nervous breakdowns um, uh, our nervous system sort of short circuiting uh, all sorts of again health problems so an easy remedy is to breathe in that full free flowing breath pattern which happens to be the pattern that induces peace joy love those feelings of well-being that uh, you know we all appreciate more Absolutely. Well, I was talking to Tanya because she teaches a meditation for recovery and how important breath work is for people who are trying to overcome addiction, whether it be substance or alcohol or whatever it is, eating. Um, have you worked with people in, with breath work for recovery? Yeah, very, very great question. Uh, years ago, I teamed up with somebody who was in a recovery program, uh, working with a recovery program. And her and I would go in and uh, we would breathe once a week with the, the people that were in the program. And they, it was their favorite part of the whole program. And partly because it, doing the breath work simulates a high, right? So it, the great thing is it's a natural high. It's, it, it, it is nothing, uh, detrimental about it and it gave them you know a place to to put their desire to have that kind of experience that escape from whatever their mundane reality that that their addictions were and this was given something to replace that as well it's you know it's helping once again to get usually our addictions are if we trace it back caused by these energies, these experiences in our life that we've held on to, the, the energy that keeps us, influencing us in darker and uglier ways, right? So by addressing that with the breath work, by purging and, and uh, bringing that energy out, there's no longer the, uh, the stimulus for them to want to reach out and, and engage in their addiction. So it, there's a two-pronged approach there plus 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 it mm. just keeps getting better by the minute that's it are there any negative side effects is there anything that people need to be <clears throat> careful of you know the i always say uh no one's ever died from breathing <laughs> the, on the contrary most people die from not breathing mm -hmm. so you know the short answer is no there's there's not any real negative side effects. Now, that being said, the one thing you can do if you, if you breathe hard and heavy, and, and especially the forcing of the exhale, which is one of the reasons why in my pattern we want to relax the exhale, but you force the exhale, you start to go into a state 
which is called alkatosis, better known as um, uh, hyperventilation. hyperventilation. <laughs> the word escaped me a second. So hyperventilating is where we actually bring in too much oxygen, we expel too much carbon dioxide, and we destroy the subtle balance that our body actually needs a certain amount of carbon dioxide to operate in balance. Uh, it's something that I don't feel is terribly a, a terrible thing because what usually happens with hyperventilation, if you really take it to the extreme, is your body is intelligent at basically saying, hey brain, stop doing that. Stop doing that brain. And if your brain's not stopping, it basically pulls the plug on the brain <laughs> and you pass out. And then the body says, now we can take over and you, you go back to a healthy breathing pattern. You wake up and then you're like, oh, maybe I shouldn't do that next time, right? Bodies are so brilliant, aren't they? Like it just knows how to regulate itself. It knows what it needs. If we just leave it alone. Exactly. Now, if, you're, if you have high blood pressure or, or things like pregnant, you know, pregnancy, actually, it's really great all the way up to um, delivery. You can be utilizing the breath and, and it's actually going to be very beneficial for the, the baby because you're bringing more oxygen in. And again, that's going to help all of those cells that are forming to create this beautiful new life. So you're giving it the best chance, but you just, you want to be a little careful. Of course, when facilitating people, we do hands-on work and there's special, you know, you don't want to uh, induce the liver, induce the liver <laughs> which, <laughs> which, which interests a different uh, touches can do. So, so that's one thing to look out for. And if you're, if you're breathing with high blood pressure, the, you know, the, basically the, the rule of thumb is keep your heart above your, or keep your head above your heart. So you don't want to necessarily lay down flat, but keep yourself propped up a little bit. Mm. I do know that there are lots of different techniques for breath work, right? Probably the, one of the most <clears throat> popular ones is the Wim Hof. It's one you hear a lot about. Um, what are the kind of the differences between the techniques if there was like an overarching way of describing that and, and is there one that's your favorite yeah that i think back and we were talking earlier just before the interview about the origins of breathwork and stuff you know and that i mean breathwork has been around since man and woman started breathing right and then it's like whoa, what do we do with this thing so the ancient yogis of the the east developed pranayama which is you know, commonly known as breath control, it really deeper meaning is life force control. And that's a whole genre unto itself. So my favorite is this integrative style of breathing. It's very accessible to me it, it, because unlike meditation or, or things where you have to be very still in body, very still in mind, and I come from a very meditative background, so I, I know um, a little bit about that. Breathwork allows your body to be much more relaxed. You can move. You don't have to worry about where the mind's going. You basically just focus on the flow of your breath and what, what comes up as a result. The, the idea is to just focus on the breathing and surrender to whatever physical sensations, whatever emotions come up, whatever insights come up. Just let them be, stay with the breath, and that's, uh, that takes you to some very interesting places. Well, you touched on it. You've got a very interesting background. Tell us a little bit about your journey and, you know, how you got to breathwork. Yes, well, breathwork, breathwork was a, a salvation for me in, uh, in the sense that I was a monk for 10 years of my life in a, in a spiritual order. Here's where we practice meditation on average of about four and a half hours each day. So I was, you know, I know what it means to, to try to sit still and try to still the mind. And one of the things I realized, you know, meditation really dates back to these ancient times. And it used to be that people didn't get techniques of meditation until they'd gone through many austerities and many practices to really discipline themselves so that when they did meditate, they could sit there and all this energy wouldn't bubble to the surface and try to take over their mind. Nowadays, meditation techniques are very accessible to people, which is a good thing. But one of the things we don't realize is that you know, they work best after the storms of all, all the held energy have been dealt with. And so if they haven't been dealt with, we sit there and that comes to the surface and then uh, uh, invades our mind and makes meditation very difficult. So the, the breath work really helps in that, in that regard. Now, what was happening was I was a monk. 
and you plan to be a monk for life, just like you typically get married and you plan to be married for life. Sometime 10 years in, I just started getting this, this call that it was time to leave. And of course, you know, this was a major life decision uh, to, to bridge the gap for people. I mean, if you ever contemplated getting divorced, uh, leaving your job, leaving your hometown, it's kind of like all three of those decisions wrapped into one. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever had to make any of those, you know, it, it often comes with a lot of self-doubt, questioning, you know, am I doing the right thing? What is the right thing? Um, and so there was a lot of anxiety and stress in my field. And like I was just mentioning about meditation, I'd sit down and all that stuff would just come to my head and it was impossible for me to meditate. So one of my friends, one of my monk friends was like, hey, you got to try this breathwork thing. I had just found out about it and blah, blah, blah. And so he, he helped introduce this to me. And what breathwork did for me in a nutshell was, first of all, helped me cope with that energy, helped sort of still it so it, it wasn't so um, agitating. Then it really helped me get in touch with my emotions and start to be able to express them in a, in a comfortable way, which was a big deal for me because I was raised in a military family and, and basically we use the slogan, big boys don't cry. You know, that was pretty much the, the mandate in the house. So our emotions were more of a liability than they were a, an asset. And so learning how to be with those emotions and express them was, you know, was a big deal. And then through that, I actually started to feel how these emotions were helping to guide me, to, to show me, they, they ultimately helped me see that the path that, that I was really resonating with was to leave, even though on paper, it was the scarier path. I mean, I had no job, I had no place to go. Uh, you know, the ashram was tried and true. I'd been there, you know, uh, I knew where I was gonna sleep, I knew what I was gonna eat. So it, it looked like, the obvious winner, but my energy just was saying, this is, this is the path. Because I went the week I left the ashram and uh, of course I had no place to go, no job and all this happened to be the training for this breath work that week. And so I jumped right out of the ashram into the training and, uh, and took the trainings, it took a few months to get certified and all that. But um, the beginning of the year, that was 2007, January 1st, 2007, I opened my doors for business and have never looked back. Great story, man. <laughs> so for people who are considering bringing breath work into their daily routine, how, how do you recommend it in terms of frequency and duration and that type of thing? That's a great question. The, I, I say this work is applicable as often as we breathe, which is pretty much every moment of every day, unless you find yourself unconsciously holding, right? Which is not a good pattern. So that being said, I usually recommend for people to start off with what I call a daily five minute joy jump start, which is this full free flowing breath pattern done for five minutes each day. Five minutes is about 108 breaths, so you can count to 108. You can put on music for five minutes. I do have courses and, and recordings that will guide you on, on these journeys. So if you'd rather have somebody, uh, uh, somebody's voice leading you on that way, that's an option. But to do this for five minutes each day just starts to shift the habit, starts to bring awareness that, that your breath might not be habituated to a healthy flow. And it starts to just give you in a gentle way, you know, steering you in that direction. Now, what you experienced was a, a deeper dive, which usually lasts approximately an hour. And that kind of breath work, let's say the average uh, prescription, shall we say, would be once a week. If, we could, if you could ideally do that, maybe once every other week, people who come to me and have intensive things they're working on might actually do it more than once a week. That being said, there's no real uh, prescription in terms of some people take on these longer forms of breathing and make that their meditation practice. So they will do a long breath session for 45 minutes to an hour each day as their meditation and such. And that's, that's fully acceptable as well. So. While you're doing brain tap. Exactly. <laughs> so if, if I were to go to my doctor and say, hmm, I'm going to start a breath work uh, routine. What, are, what does Western medicine say about breath work? 
And for the longest time, Western medicine didn't say anything about breath work. Uh, these days, it seems to be, I've seen many more articles, many more things that are starting to extol the virtues of breath work. And I think that's coming because it, it's starting to gain momentum in our culture. And, and the basically, where there's interest, we start to study these things. For the longest time, there were no studies on the breath. And I have my own theories about that, but I think whenever there's a question, follow the money, and there's not a lot of money in breathing. Breathing is a very accessible, free uh, process that everybody can do, and therefore companies can't patent it or can't package it in a way that, you know, that then they can sell you for the rest of your life on. And it takes so. you away from uh, Ambien and Xanax and yeah, right. <laughs> all if you're, the drugs that they've prescribed to get it, to those states. Yeah, if you're breathing and, and you're releasing your anxiety, you're releasing your stress, you say, I don't need these pills anymore. And the mm -hmm. people who are making the pills are like, wait a second, we, you need to have these. So there's a lot of studies on, on those things that, you know, that show some often marginal uh, improvement by taking these things over and over. But breath, which isn't very profitable from these companies' perspective, isn't, it, you know, isn't worth researching. So there wasn't a lot of research, and, and therefore we were in the dark about it a lot. And, and we had to rely on what the yogis said in the past and, and then our own just experimentations. Nowadays, it, it seems to have caught on Similar to like, uh, I, I saw an article in the paper the other day. It says breathwork, the new yoga. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's like really, they do it's call like, one of the fastest growing health trends in the worldwide. Yeah, yeah. So it is, and and in, in that sense, you know, yoga twenty years ago, thirty years ago. I mean, I remember, I'm old enough to remember when yoga wasn't a a thing, right? It, the, it was uh, for weirdos or hippies to do, you know, but, mm -hmm. but the mainstream certainly wasn't interested. And now it's probably when, when you say exercise, the, if somebody had to guess what exercise nine times out of 10, they'd probably say yoga, mm -hmm. you know? So, so yes, breathwork has, has gained in popularity. Uh, and again, because I think we, there's a lot of awakening that's happening now. People are, people are tired of like all these um, complex and, and uh, nebulous ways to try to heal ourselves. And we're, we're recognizing, wow, there's some really basic things that we can do that, that we all have access to. And it really feels good too. And it, it's kind of, it creates some exciting experiences. And, and so that, you know, again, the, just like we were talking about the uh, in the recovery sense, you don't have to you don't have to be in recovery to also feel high doing breath work, and it's a very pleasant and, and euphoric type of experience, as well as putting money in the health bank, essentially. So, so what does your daily routine include? Obviously, breath work, but are there other <laughs> modalities that you bring into your routine? Yeah, the uh, you know, as a monk. The, the one thing that I realized is that the spiritual path that, that we were on was, was a very formal path. And, and when I left, I was like, what can I, you know, people were asking me, what is it that, what about that is, you know, can, yeah, what can we take with me? What can you tell me about that? You know, and I sat and thought, and I really realized there was basically five habits that we practice on a daily basis that pretty much comprised our life. And these are five habits that I must admit, I don't necessarily do daily now. And, uh, but there are five habits that I encourage people. In fact, I've even got uh, an ebook that, that talks about them. But the, the five habits, and I, I try to do these as often as I can, is you know, meditation or what I call communion now. So that would include breath work or prayer or you know, anything that's going to draw you inward and let you sort of release your, your relationship with the outer world temporarily. Uh, next is introspection. So taking time to really reflect on your life using the quote Socrates said, uh, an unexamined life is not worth living, right? So really meaning to, if we don't examine our life, we're destined to continue to repeat our bad habits over and over again as, as we're unconscious of them. But to examine our lives, we can start to see where we're fulfilling our 
the, our, our noble goals and aspirations and where we are falling short. And then we can create a game plan to, to try to modify that. Uh, study, so study meaning uh, consuming the writings, the intelligent uh, you know, podcasts these days, the uh, YouTubes on anybody in the field that you are interested in becoming an expert in. So in, in that case, it was the spiritual field. You know, we read the scriptures, the writings of Yogananda, the lives of saints. I mean, if you want to be a great businessman, you're going to, you know, probably study Steve Jobs and Warren Buffett and, and these kind of guys. Um, you want to be a great musician, you know, you'll, you'll study in that form. So those three uh, physical exercise, actually. So I, um, that was one habit that was highly stressed in the, in the ashram environment because, uh, I mean, the, the premise being it's hard to speak to God when your temple is broken, right? When your, your temple is decrepit. So to keep this body temple uh, physically fit so that when we do actually sit for meditation, your back's not saying, hey, pay attention to me, not to God, you know? And uh, so uh, physical exercise and then ultimately service. So service and the, the way I define service by how we, we uh, approached it was not that you necessarily need to do something different. It's not like if you are um, CEO of some company, you got to quit your job and you know, serve soup at, in a soup kitchen or something like that. But it's doing what you're doing from a different perspective, from the perspective of how can what I'm doing serve the greater population, you know, those around me, those that, you know, maybe are utilizing my products or otherwise, versus how can I do this to get the most profit or to, to benefit me the most or, or, you know, doing something out of a motivation of fear or, or otherwise. So... So those are the five things that I try to incorporate into my routine as often as I can. Awesome. I love that. Gratitude, too, right? Gratitude, yes. Christian, this has been such an incredible amount of information. I'm sure people are going to want to learn more. So how do people follow you or find you? I downloaded a couple of your courses recently, so I'm super excited to get to dive more into those. But how do people find you? Uh, the best place is probably breathflow.com, my website, breathflow. Where'd you get that? <laughs> <laughs> that's a great one. Yeah. It's a, well, like I said, 15 years ago, nobody cared about the breath. Oh. So all the breath URLs were wide open. <laughs> and and uh, fortunately, that's the name of my company. So I, I was able to get that and I've had it all these years. Uh, on that website, then there's a... Uh, of course, a page of my events, page of my offerings. Uh, uh, what I usually recommend for people to get started is a course that I have called Inhale Life, you know, and it's a home study course and then guided sessions that will, will take people on the journey. If uh, I really recommend for people, I mean, this is if people want to do it on their own, but I, I highly recommend that people tune in to either a group session or an individual session and fortunately, the, the one great thing that came out of the whole COVID uh, fiasco, I'll call it, was that it forced me to go online with my work and found that it actually translates very well to an online sessions. So both online group sessions and online uh, individual sessions, which opened my reach up to uh, you know, I used to have to travel to all these locations and, and that was very limiting as far as the people I could serve. Now, people can come to me through the, the internet waves and, uh, and can still have profoundly great experiences with it. So, so if you're bold, I would recommend having one of those as your really first experience because you, you have a facilitator to, to guide you on and I like to say there's nothing inherently dangerous about breathwork, but what can happen as we were talking earlier, as this energy comes up, you know, sometimes it's old energy. Well, it was energy that we weren't uncomfortable with in the first place, which is why we stuffed, stuffed it, down. it down. So as it comes back up, you know, we might be a little frightened by it or get a little extra anxious by it. And, and ultimately it's the good news, but it's helpful if somebody who knows the lay of the land can, guide you through those moments and and then get you to the other side once you're comfortable with all that i ha you know my my 
thrust is to get people up and running on their own two feet, essentially. And it, it goes, again, the breath is something, I call it our portable therapy, right? We can take it anywhere, we can use it anytime. You don't need any props, you don't need anybody else, ultimately, once you know what you're doing, so. Well, and we've got a session coming up today, so we're mm -hmm. super excited to have you here. Thank you so much, Christian. I appreciate all of your time, and I'm looking forward to the next session. Well, thank you so much for this time of yours as well. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Delphine Circle. Don't forget to subscribe. It's free and it will help us keep these incredible interviews coming your way. Here are two other episodes you may enjoy. I'm Delphine. Welcome to my circle.